for today, we are so privileged to have uh, our two speakers, uh, Dr. Henry Sedu Dana is our first speaker. Uh, he is uh, a lawyer by profession and an expert in chieftaincy and traditional issues. Uh, Dr. Dana studied at the University of Ghana Law Faculty uh, and also went to the uh, to London School of Economics and Political Science for his master's and PhD in law uh, between 1986 and 1992. He was called to the bar in Ghana in 1997 as the first blind person. Dr. Dana was, uh, lost his sight at the age of seven. Uh, Dr. Dana, after his studies came back and he worked at the chief dance secretariat in Ghana as a research officer. And he rose to the ranks and became the chief research officer uh, and later became the director. He was then appointed as Minister of State for the Ministry of Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs in Ghana, uh, which he served uh, until 2017. Dr. Adana was again the first minister uh, uh, who is visually impaired to be appointed a minister of state in Ghana. Uh, and he is, he's been a huge inspiration to the visually, uh, to not only the visually impaired, but the, the differently abled in Ghana and beyond. So we are so privileged to have someone like Dr. Dana who has worked in the institute, the chief science institutions uh, and also interfacing with governance to be one of the speakers. Our second speaker is Professor Francis Sinyamjo, a brother and a friend and a colleague at the University of uh, Cape Town uh, in South Africa. He did his studies at the University of Yaoundé in Cameroon uh, and also went to University of Leicester in the UK uh, where he studied for, uh, for, uh, for, for his PhD studies. He joined the University of Cape Town in, in 2009 2009 as professor of social anthropology. Uh, he has taught sociology, anthropology, and communications at, at universities in Cameroon and Botswana, and has researched and written extensively on Cameroon and Botswana. Professor Yamjo is, uh, has had quite a number of awards, uh, and he has sent a paper out for those of you who were able to read, to read it. Uh, it's a fascinating paper uh, looking at the Institute of Chief Sansi uh, uh, and its engagement in modern African uh, state of uh, governance and, and democracy. So I call upon our first speaker, Dr. Dana, uh, Henry Dana, to uh, uh, take the floor. Thank you. And good afternoon to all listeners. In this presentation, an attempt has been made to answer some questions about chiefs and their relations with the Ghanaian state. First, who is a chief? And then chiefs state relations, what is the issue? Chiefs not allowed to participate in partisan politics, what is the cultural underlying philosophy. Non-participation of chiefs in active party politics as a constitutional concept. What are the origins? What is the mandate of chiefs under the Ghanaian constitution? How do chiefs contribute to the political process in Ghana? What is the way forward for our democracy? These and other questions are of interest to us here. Who is a chief? Article 277 of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana tells us that a chief is any person who is a member of the appropriate family and has been nominated, selected, 
and installed, installed or skinned as a chief or queen mother in line with the relevant custom and usage. A more broad cultural definition, apart from the legal, could help us perhaps understand the subject matter. A chief is not only the symbol of the union for the community and spokesman for all, but he is also judge or arbiter in disputes that arise within the chiefdom and the rallying point of all the people in the hour of danger. The issue about relations between chiefs and the state. Relations between state and chiefs has always been an issue since the inception of the modern Ghanaian state in its present form. That is to say, first, what it was as a colony alongside protectorates, that's 1901 to 1957. And second, as independent republic up to the present date. With the coming into force of the native administration ordinance of 1901, passed by the British colonial authorities. One of the things that happened was the establishment of the Office of Native Affairs. So important was this office considered to be that it was placed directly under the office of the colonial governor himself. The reason for this was clear. It was realized that misunderstanding and mistrust between the state on the one hand and on the other, the chiefs, could not only bring about trouble, but in fact, outright rebellion or war. What more, it was also realized that apart from the issue of state and chiefs relations, there was also the issue of chiefs, chiefs relations which had to be dealt with. Accordingly, the Office of Native Affairs, which was assisted by a researcher or anthropologist by name R.S. Ratri, had the daunting task to inform and advise the colonial governor about issues or matters arising, one, between the states and chiefs, and two, between chiefs and fellow chiefs, that is to say, the traditional rulers of the various native states, as they were so-called. After independence and the subsequent establishment of the First Republic, the Office of Native Affairs continued to function, but under a different name and with different personnel. Under the Chieftaincy Act, Act 81 of 1961, we now had the Chieftaincy Commission under the office of the president, which had the duty not only to inform and advise government regarding relevant issues about chieftaincy, but also hear and settle matters that arose between chiefs with the assistance of chieftaincy officers or staff. Under the Second Republic, we had the chieftaincy secretariat which was established with the coming into force of the Chieftaincy Act, Act 370 of 1971. Needless to say, it took the place of the Chieftaincy Commission, which ceased to be. The Chieftaincy Secretariat continued to operate right from the 1970s to 2006. Over the years, it played the dual role of advising government in respect of chieftaincy matters, and at the same time, assisting the various houses of chiefs in their day-to-day -day administration, as well as research and other matters, as was the case with its predecessors, the Chieftaincy Commission and the Office of Native Affairs. With the establishment of the Ministry of Chieftaincy in 2006, the Chieftaincy Secretariat became part and parcel of the ministry, 
and has remained so up to the present time. Now we we'll look at chiefs not allowed in active party politics. Article 276 of the 1932 Constitution of Ghana, which is at present the supreme law of the land, is clear about the matter. It provides, and I quote, a chief shall not take part in active party politics. And any chief wishing to do so and seeking election to parliament shall abdicate his tooth or skin. Code close. At this juncture, it is interesting to note that the non-participation of chiefs in partisan politics is a constitutional concept not known only in Ghana. In fact, the 1995 Constitution of Uganda adapts the concept. Again, for the avoidance of doubt, let us take a look at Article 2463E of the Ugandan Constitution, which provides as follows, and I quote, a person shall not, while remaining a traditional leader or cultural leader, join or participate in partisan politics, unquote. Culturally, the philosophy underlying the aforementioned constitutional concept can probably can properly be understood by referring to the words of K. A. Buzia in his work on Ghanaian anthropology. Writing about the Asante political system in 1951, he put the matter in the following words as regarding the position of the chief as a unifier. And I quote, the picture presented is that of a segmentary political system in which the segments or states possessing similar social and political institutions, a common language and a religion were bound by ties of clanship and welded into a union by the Asante Hene, whose capital was Kumasi. Quote, the point being emphasized here is the fact that because the chief is the symbol of unity of all, the component units of the community, for him to participate actively in partisan politics will amount to compromising or undermining unity since he will be for some of the people, but against others. In other words, the syndrome of we versus they clearly is far below the dignity and all and sacrosanct of traditional chieftaincy. Non-participation of chiefs in partisan politics. What are the origins? Not long after Ghana gained independence from the United Kingdom in 1957, there occurred misunderstanding and controversy resulting in serious mistrust between many traditional rulers on the one hand and the then, the then government of the country. As a matter of fact, during the first republic, which was promulgated in 1960, matters came to a head. The Chieftaincy Act, Act 81 of 1961, was passed ostensibly to prevent chiefs from using their positions to aid opposition against the government. The much talked about recognition clause of the act is quoted here at length, and I quote section 11. A chief is an individual who A, has been nominated, elected, and installed as a chief in accordance with customary law, and B, is recognized as a chief by the minister. Two, the minister may by executive instrument at any time withdraw recognition from a chief if A, the chief has been distilled and his appeal against the distillment has been dismissed or the period allowed for appealing has elapsed without an appeal being brought. Or B, the minister considers it in, to be in the public interest to withdraw recognition, could close. 
what this clause meant in effect was that becoming a chief as well as remaining as a chief more or less were at the pleasure of the minister. Not surprisingly, chiefs who were known opponents of the government began losing their positions. At the same time, chiefs who were known supporters of the government were given paramount status in some cases where they were mere subordinates. The sad part of the drama that unfolded was that in the beginning, what was a quarrel between chiefs and government now also became a chief, a quarrel between chiefs themselves. That is to say, chiefs who supported the CPP government of President Kwame Nkrumah on the one hand, and on the other, those who supported the UP opposition. Chieftaincy and politics became mixed up. The consequence of all this was that in 1966, when the government was overthrown in the military coup, many chiefs also lost their positions. To put it mildly, the institution of chieftaincy became traumatized. In some cases, friendships between chiefs were broken. Traditional allies sadly became more or less enemies. In some cases, there were even confrontations between chiefs and subjects resulting in open acrimonious arguments, thereby breaching the sacredness of traditional chieftaincy. One is therefore not at all surprised that in 1969, when the second Republican constitution was being drafted, wisdom dictated that institution of chieftaincy be kept separate from politics. In the same way, wisdom dictated that government should not and cannot interfere as to who is a chief or not. So far as Ghanaian democratic practice is concerned, the 1969 constitutional proposition regarding chieftaincy and politics was nothing but a realistic compromise between the older order and the new, a compromise which paid off over the last 50 years. Some have argued that by preventing chiefs from participating in active party politics, they are not being treated fairly. In this presentation, the humble sub submission, however, is that if we allow chiefs participation in open partisan politics, we will sooner or later find out that we are toying with a double-edged sword. Chiefs mandate under the constitution. What mandate have chiefs under the 1992 constitution of Ghana? Article 272 of the constitution mandates the National House of Chiefs to advise government on matters affecting chieftaincy, codify lines of succession to stools and skins, among other things, so as to prevent succession disputes and modify customary practices that are outmoded and socially harmful. The National House of Chiefs comprises five delegates from each of the regional houses in the country. The National House of Chiefs, which is the apex body of chieftaincy, has a president who is elected by the house for a term of four years. It is one of the important bodies, constitutional bodies, since it speaks and acts on behalf of all chiefs in the country. In a nutshell, the mandate of chiefs has been limited by the constitution to matters about chieftaincy, tradition, and customary practice. It is important to point out that the houses of chiefs, both national and regional, are creations of statute. Therefore, are guided in their operations by the Chieftaincy Act 759 of 2008, 
as well as the relevant legislative instruments. Equally, it has to be mentioned that although the houses of chiefs have the judicial power to adjudicate in disputes over chieftains' succession and jurisdiction, as the case may be, they cannot and do not install or skin chiefs. Neither do they distool or de-skin chiefs. Every stool or skin within its traditional area has its own traditional kingmakers, as well as its uh, instrument and instrument procedures. Now, how do chiefs contribute to the political process? The fact that chiefs do not participate in active party politics does not mean they do not contribute in any way to the political process of Ghana. Indeed, it will be misleading to think that chiefs care little about what happens politically in the country. For instance, anything that borders on the peace and stability of the country is a source of grave worry to chiefs. In such situations, the National House of Chiefs will normally seek closed door audience with the President of the Republic to voice its concerns and views about the matter. Of course, such concerns and views when expressed are not taken lightly by any president. It is true that such silent diplomacy by chiefs from time to time has contributed immensely towards easing tension between political actors and by so doing have provided Ghanaians with a source of reassurance of national unity and strength. Conclusion and the way forward. Looking back at where we came from before colonial rule, what transpired during the colonial period and the subsequent happenings of the first, second, third and fourth republics, including military regimes, the way forward for our democracy must be strengthening compromise between the political order and the traditional. Our ability to get it right between politicians and chiefs for a long time to come will be one of the determining factors in the success of our democratic experiment. The matter can well be summarized, summed up by referring to two proverbial sayings by some of the greatest chiefs of the land who lived hundreds of years ago. One, even if the phantom from drum can make the loudest echo in the forest, you cannot say that it can swallow the elephant or the lion. Two, if three babies are all sitting on the same skin, then you cannot say that any one of them is a fool. Whether we like it or not, today we find ourselves in a society where there is the liberal democratic order and where there is also the culturally ingrained traditional order of things. The more dialogue, dialoguing, mutual trust and respect there is between chiefs and politicians, the better it will be for our democracy. On the other, on the contrary, sorry, the more chiefs become openly partisan, there will be more mistrust and division, not just between chiefs and the politicians, but also between chiefs themselves divided along partisan lines. This, of course, will not at all help our democracy. Last but not the least, it's a fact that we should not at all lose sight of. And it is that chieftaincy is a value institution. It is a kind of belief system which can command the hearts and minds of people. As a result of this, the chief within the chiefdom is not an ordinary person. He is one large numbers of people will fight with, will fight for with sweat and blood. 
once it appears to them the chief is under attack, no matter who the perceived attacker is. This is one of the reasons why disputes between claimants to chieftaincy succession, if not well handled, easily boil over into violence, leading to the loss of lives and property. The participation of chiefs in open partisan politics, particularly during election hearing, could have dire consequences on the democratic process and the entire political climate. What more, it is common knowledge that in the very remote parts of Ghana, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of villages and cottages. In these villages and cottages, there are no police stations, neither are there any other security services. People in these communities rely on chiefs, mainly as authorities in charge of peace and order. This then makes one wonder whether the whether individual right of freedom of choice, which is a prerequisite of the multi-party system, can be guaranteed in these communities if chiefs were allowed participation in active party politics. This is because the first inclination of people by and large will be to support the party which is supported by the chief so that they will be more than welcome to the chief's palace in case of any eventuality. What has been done in this presentation, it is hoped, has made better our understanding of chieftaincy politics in the multi in the multi party system as practiced in Ghana. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dana. Thank you very much. Uh, we are so grateful for that uh, presentation. Uh, for so, for those of you who have just joined, uh, Dr. Dana is the a former Minister of State for Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs in Ghana. He's a lawyer by profession. We thank you so much. And uh, our next speaker is Professor Nyamjo, Francis Nyamjo from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And he will be addressing the same topic, the chief and the state in the multi-party democracy in Africa. Prof Nyamjo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, John, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Dana for setting the scene uh, very well for, for, for this conversation. And uh, uh, first, uh, to start with uh, situating myself in relation to chiefs by saying that uh, I have had the privilege of growing up in two chiefdoms in Cameroon. Uh, 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 the chiefdom of, uh, of Boom and uh, the chiefdom of uh, Mankon, both of which are chiefdoms in a region of Cameroon with over 400 years of, 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 of existence of that particular institution. I speak, uh, therefore, as an insider observer, uh, one uh, who has witnessed uh, the uh, uh, relationship uh, between uh, 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 chiefs and, and the state uh, uh, and po politics and, and, and party politics closely from within and uh, 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 Additionally, as uh, a scholar with an interest in this area, I, I believe that uh, for us to get uh, uh, it right in terms of what is at stake when we discuss uh, uh, chiefs and multi party politics, we have to understand, uh, have a certain sense of, of background uh, in, uh, uh, to, uh, about. Uh, the, the, our, our states as they are, 
and the various institutions and, uh, and the roles uh, that they have been made uh, to play in them. Uh, the, the first thing that strikes us is that uh, uh, chiefs and chieftaincy is an institution uh, that uh, has uh, uh, that predates uh, the state, at least the modern state in in, in an African context. Uh, we, we we go back to uh, the late fifties and uh, uh, early sixties uh, uh, um, uh, 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 to talk about and the the. Uh, independent state as we we have it in in in, in different countries so uh, normally uh, uh, if one had uh, to uh, think in terms of mileage in democracy uh, the modern state should be learning from 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 from, from, from chieftaincies uh, um, uh, instead of uh, having things the other way around and the, I, I would I, I would like us uh, to uh, note uh, uh, from the outset that uh, uh, chief, chieftaincy as an institution uh, is a very, very democratic institution. Not necessarily in terms of uh, party politics as we understand it or liberal democracy as uh, we articulate it in, 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 uh, in, in, in an African context, but democratic in the sense of uh, the, 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 uh, the, the institutions that have been put in place, the provision for participation, for reproduction of that particular, the, 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 the various uh, uh, aspects of, of the societies where the chiefs uh, 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 operate, and uh, who, who uh, what, what degree of, 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 of involvement of the people in in in, in reproducing the, these institutions of our time, we, we see that uh, a lot of thought has gone into them. Uh, 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 different uh, 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 provisions have been made for participation uh, 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 at different levels of ensuring that uh, who becomes chief, who are those who who who, who help uh, 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 to to play a part. In, in keeping the institution going, uh, 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 there's an element of, 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 of democracy there that we shouldn't take lightly or we shouldn't trivialize simply when we uh, uh, adopt a caricatured version of democracy that has come with our colonial experience and post-colonial machinations. Uh, the, 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 within, if you take every chiefdom, like uh, uh, let me give the example of the chiefdom of of of, of Mankon, uh, where uh, uh, one of the chiefdoms where I grew up. Uh, the chief uh, is we call them funds uh, uh, is uh, someone who. Uh, is at the center of uh, the kingdom, and the uh, the kingdom uh, uh, attracts people from from different uh, clans and lineages uh, uh, to, to to act as representatives or eyes and ears of those various uh, uh, clans and, and 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 lineages uh, uh, within uh, uh, the palace. And it is, it, it, it is instructive that when we look at a palace like that of Mankon, and we see uh, 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 the, the chief having uh, 20 wives or more wives, the, the, the normal tendency, if we are measuring from a yardstick uh, 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 that is not uh, informed and inserted in the in, in the cultural context is that how can somebody possibly have uh, uh, twenty wives or so? Just a manner of speaking. But if you look at the diplomacy of uh, 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 representation in the palace in order to be have a stake in in in, in, in power uh, dynamics uh, uh, and the say of how the kingdom goes. 
then what you find as a daughter of a given clan in, 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 in a certain palace is more than just the idea of a wife as we understand it. Uh, it is almost like a diplomatic presence for different clan heads by having a daughter of theirs in the palace who acts as an, the ear and the eyes of that uh, notable or that clan head who is not present in the palace. So the link and interconnections is what, mar what diplomatic political services a marriage serves over and above the simple fact of a union between two individuals. So that, that strikes me. And also when you look very closely, uh, 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 the, the, the marriage within a given uh, chiefdom uh, is beyond the simple relationship uh, 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 of, of, of within that chiefdom. You can have interchiefdom relationships. And uh, uh, in the grass fields, for example, uh, the, the fawn of, of Mankon would have a wife from a different distant fawndom, uh, the fawn, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, marriage as a, 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 a way of initiating and maintaining diplomatic relations within the clan, uh, the, the, the chiefdom, and uh, outside with other chiefs, and so on and so forth, that one. The second degree of democracy that I noticed was uh, tolerance, the shared tolerance and welcoming nature to people that you ordinarily would consider strangers and uh, not part of the fold. And you, you could see the, uh, 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 it right into colonial times, first encounters with the colonizing authorities, reaching out and embracing the missionaries who came wanting to set up a church and wanting to set up schools and hospitals. And you, you give them land in your kingdom or your chiefdom uh, for them to set up. And uh, 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 the, the, uh, sometimes, and in the case of, of, of Mancon, uh, again, uh, when, if, if the Catholics came first, the Roman Catholics came first uh, and had land to set up schools and, and hospitals, it, it, does, it didn't imply uh, that the chief would limit only to those. It opened up also to Protestants and to Muslims. And so it is a very accommodating disposition in, in a way in a way of taking the outside in to become part of your kingdom so your kingdom is not in terms of the 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 the, the, uh, the, uh, the population not a homogeneous kingdom necessarily the capacity to embrace others and make your kingdom a cosmopolitan reality is something that is indicative of, of uh, a very, uh, a very uh, a significant dimension of, of the democratic disposition of, of, of these uh, kingdom. So you find that within, and you also have the sense of uh, a, 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 a initial reticence towards Em, uh, embracing uh, things that you considered like schools and 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 like and in the case of uh, Mancon again the the, the fun uh, the current chief dared to go to school because he felt it was a nice thing for him uh, he had the foresight to think this was something that would stay with us for long and uh, 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 his father felt insulted for him going to school but he was able eventually to use the school at, uh, to serve his father in a way that uh, led to his father re-embracing him as a member of, 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 of the kingdom. So you see the dynamism in the institution, uh, always with a democratic disposition, the opening up to allow uh, uh, for, 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 uh, 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 total strangers to become part of the fold for uh, people within your uh, uh, chiefdom uh, to to participate in 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 in, in the unfolding of, of of things. So I, I I thought it's important to look within the internal dynamics for the ingredients of democracy, which we uh, the, the, uh, the, the the chiefdoms now contribute 
uh, 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 within a multi-party uh, system. And uh, to see how our multi-party system therefore doesn't have to be something that is simply transplanted from uh, the former colonial authority, but is inserted in conversation and in negotiation with much longer, uh, 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 much, much tested institutions uh, uh, within uh, uh, the, 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 the country. Uh, 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 and you have that, that, that conversation and intersections. So our, our multi-party democracy in this case should be one that takes on board the, the democratic traditions that predate our, our colonial experience and produces a complexity that is negotiated in a way where the role of the chiefs uh, uh, does not have a priori uh, to be uh, defined by uh, citizens of the kingdoms who now want to pass for modern elites and to use the, the chief simply as auxiliaries. And uh, uh, the, what, one of the chiefs that I, 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 I talk about in, in the paper, uh, again, uh, that of Mankon, wrote a book which, which is quite instructive in this area titled Royalty and Politics, The Story of My Life, in which uh, uh, he has risen, not only is he a, a chief, he is a well-educated chief, he has uh, uh, he joined multi-party politics and became a parliamentarian, uh, rose to the ranks of being this, uh, the, uh, the, the first vice president of the ruling party, second only to the national president, and is, uh, he has been able to marry those two uh, uh, relationships in fascinating ways, in instructive ways, in ways that can uh, 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 give us uh, 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 inspiration on how to be creative in how we think about chiefs and uh, multi-party politics. The second chief uh, that uh, you would notice in the paper that I presented is uh, Seritsa Kama, who rose to the ranks of becoming the, press, the first president of, of, of Botswana, uh, and uh, who also, through uh, uh, being an African prince, uh, studied in the UK, uh, got uh, uh, mar uh, married to uh, uh, a British uh, uh, citizen in something that was uh, quite a, a controversial marriage, but uh, was able to, uh, through constant negotiation and this capacity uh, uh, that is, is common in, 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 uh, throughout uh, African chiefdoms, to embrace the outside, not as, a, not as something you bring into to eclipse what you are, but to merge with it, to complement it in order to build something much more uh, sophisticated, much more uh, complex. And it is that complexity, that constant uh, toing and froing uh, 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 amongst different influences that layers you up and makes our experience of democracy a truly complex, uh, composite one that has roots that are, 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 are deep roots from an African tradition uh, with the novelties that come from encounters with others and encounters that are not meant to erase, but to enrich. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof Nyamjo, for that very concise uh, presentation. And the floor open for questions. And uh, uh, there is a question here for Dr. Dana. Uh, and uh, I joined the Chief Tensei Service September 1994 and worked in the system for 19 years before I became a minister for four years, making 23 years. And what I know is that uh, I, will, I will say that foreigners sometimes come to the Chief Tensei Secretariat to ask uh, what are the benefits or are there any entitlements for Kwaswahini if somebody from Holland or 
United States is made on concerning Ghana. Are there any benefits or are there any entitlements? And the answer is no. The reason being that chieftaincy, we have a, 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 a register for chiefs, national register of chiefs. And you, you, there's a procedure, as I've read the law out, you have to be installed, you know, you will come from appropriate lineage in accordance with the relevant customer law. And then your name is entered into the register. Until, unless you are disturbed or otherwise, you remain there, the, the name remains there till you die. When Kwaswahine or development chief, they are not, uh, they, we call them tutelar chiefs. It's an acknowledgement of something that uh, the person has done, you know, and uh, giving that title to the person, it doesn't, that person doesn't need to come from any royal family. It's purely based on contribution to society. And so um, if chiefs are entitled to allowances, there wouldn't be any for, uh, for the question because they are not even registered. And also if chiefs are having a, a, meet, a meeting or a house of chiefs meeting or traditional council, in, 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 I don't think that Mkwaswa uh, Hines are members. Development chiefs generally are titular chiefs, title holders, in acknowledgement of contribution to show that uh, you, they honor you for what you have done. I think that's what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dana. Uh, what is the role of traditional judiciary in the installation of chiefs? Uh, how can the installation of chiefs by political leaders stop in Africa? In other words, the interference, the interference into the installation of chiefs by politicians. What can be done to curb that? I, I, th I think uh, the traditional judiciary should normally be the ones uh, 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 that uh, precede any uh, uh, how would I call it, uh, 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 robust, uh, robust stamp, stamping, uh, as it were, uh, by, by the, the, the politicians. The primary thing is that uh, it, the chief has to be decided upon by the instances of legitimation within a given traditional setting. And once they have announced it to the public, then the politicians can then take over from there to, to do the validation uh, uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Dana was talking about, ensuring that uh, 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 you, whether classifying you, whether you're a first class chief or a second or third, what your allowances would be and, and the administrative bit. But normally uh, uh, the, the traditional uh, judiciary set up or uh, 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 king making mechanisms are not supposed to be interfered with by, by the politicians. But given that it's a power play and that uh, 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 quite a few, um, some of our modern uh, political elite uh, in, in, in traditional settings would have been just commoners, now they come back uh, uh, with, with added legitimacy uh, credentials of various kinds, they, 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 they turn the tables uh, quite uh, uh, effortlessly and they are determined to show who is uh, in charge. And, and those tensions are unnecessary because uh, uh, they, they, they distract uh, instead of uh, constructing and making the best of both worlds. Uh, the, the profound embedded uh, uh, knowledge tested through history of, 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 of chieftaincy that withstood colonialism demonstrated its res resilience, even as it, uh, they tried to water it down has outlived it and has a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience to share. And I, I don't think that it's in the best interest of uh, 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 politicians to uh, seek to diminish these institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Yamjo. Uh, to Dr. Dana again. Doc, the question is whether uh, you have encountered some challenges as you struggled in your position between the chieftaincy institution and the state as minister. 
what were some of the challenges that you, you encountered having to deal with these traditional authorities and the uh, secular uh, government authorities? Thank you for the question. Actually, I did face challenges, but that was not when I was the minister. It was when I was the professional director of chieftaincy research in charge of all chieftaincy projects, lines of succession, land ownership, family, going around the country at least twice a year, visiting over 100 treasure councils. That was where I had challenges. And it is this, um, you go to some areas, probably due to one reason or another, the, 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 the political stake is there. So, um, you know, you, you, are, you are a children's secretary. The question is, are you working for government or you are working for the chiefs? The, I remember a question some asked, uh, they would like to know who sent me, who sent you on this, on this mission? Was it the government or, or the, the, the chiefs? When you hear things like that, that tells you that, that there, is, there is tension. And that's where expertise comes in. You have to take time to explain we have to bear in mind that most of the conflicts that occur in Chief is due to nothing but suspicion and suspicion. Uh, uh, dispute has never uh, uh, erupted overnight. People sleep in the morning, there's dispute. No, it never happens like that anyway. It's because uh, there, is, there are complaints which are not addressed. And with time, the complaints become uh, grievances. And if they are not, um, giving them extra attention, then they degenerate into what I call boiling disputes. And at that stage, then they can explode. But as long as they, you, they, they are, they, the right things are done and the, the, the suspicions are cleared, uh, Chief Tessie can be a very nice place to work with. And of course, military governments, uh, in my researches, I, I didn't face it personally, but they, uh, there were issues sometimes People gave stories like uh, soldiers who are who are unhappy coming to, you know, uh, threatening that they want this person in put in the register. Now, you know, those kind of tensions. Uh, uh, they, they, they. But when I was the minister, I really didn't uh, face any challenges, probably because I've done this work for 19 years and the chiefs, there's no chief in Ghana, the uh, big chief who doesn't know me. And so I, I, and I tried to be honest with them as possible. And so there was a trust. And because I had a trust, it, I, I really enjoyed it, it, my ministership. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nicole from South Africa, it's your question for Prof. Nyamjo or for Dr. Dana, please. Thank you very much to our two speakers for a, a very interesting presentation. Um, my question is addressed to the two of you, and it has got several layers. Uh, first of all, is the chieftaincy really um, a democratic institution? Because it seems that women are, are not uh, used as chiefs. Yes, and John is um, smiling because he knows me. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, it just seems that women are used as, as just, you know, um, tools to maintain a good uh, diplomatic relationships between different chiefdoms or kingdoms um, through marriages. Uh, and also uh, related to that question, um, if uh, the, uh, the chief is a genuine um, Democratic institution, uh, what about kingdoms where you have got to belong to a certain lineage to, 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 to accede to the position of local king in that area or local chief in that area? Um, if you know the two speakers could uh, respond to that, uh, to that uh, multi-layered question. And if uh, Dr. Niam Jo could, could also very briefly you know, uh, tell us a little bit uh, uh, about the, uh, the um, contrasts and differences between chiefdoms and kingdoms here in South Africa and in other parts of Africa. 
Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Professor Nyamjo, if you will go first. Okay, uh, Nicole, I will answer your question and the other I will invite you to uh, uh, read the paper that I, I, I gave John and uh, Emmanuel to circulate. And I think they, they put it on the website, so it, it gives more detail. But just the first would be that uh, uh, I, I, I agree with you that we don't have as many female chiefs as we should have, uh, but they do exist. And uh, in, the, in the paper that I pre-circulated, I, I give the example of the first paramount female chief mm. in Botswana, uh, who was uh, the chief of the Balete uh, installed. And I happened to be present then, and I went for the installation gala Mm -hmm. And uh, Miriam Makeba was the special, uh, specially invited to perform at that gala uh, function. And in her uh, uh, very dignified way, she was very proud to make that point that, uh, you know, we are, we, are, we are pleased to have a woman paramount chief. And by woman, I mean W.O. man. And so we were all here, <laughs> it means well-organized man. So in a way, we would need, we, we could have a, a, a lot more, we could do with a lot more well-organized men as chiefs uh, in, 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 in an African setting. But what, what, what inspires me is the fact that like every human institution, chieftaincy is dynamic. And you can see the dynamism that is currently unfolding in, in, in the South African context, uh, whether you're talking about uh, the, 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 the king of uh, the new king of, 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 of Zulus, uh, who, who, whose succession, whose enthronement is constantly being contested by uh, uh, some of his uh, uh, relatives. But eventually that dynamism uh, for me, is an element of the democracy in the process. That is not just uh, 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 tokenism when, when they talk uh, contestation, negotiation, and uh, finally agreeing on a candidate or so on. Even when the king has only one wife, it is not, uh, it's not uh, uh, a given uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, the son will succeed necessarily. So I think for me, I, I believe that every demo, uh, democracy or every uh, 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 institution that is dynamic, uh, that uh, has a measure of tolerance and include, uh, provides for participation, ticks the boxes of democracy for me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, Dr. Dana, briefly, because there are quite a number of questions for you. So if you can yes. respond briefly to the well, women issue, the gender yeah, issue. Thank you. I'll make it brief as possible. The first thing I want to say is that in Ghana, we have women participating in chieftaincy. We have, if when I read the definition of chief by our uh, 1992 constitution, I said installed as a chief or queen mother. And so uh, 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 and you have, every chief has the, the, a queen mother. Queen mother means somebody from the royal lineage, either the sister or the auntie. If the chief marries a wife from somewhere, that wife from somewhere cannot be a, a, a queen in that traditional area because it's, it's something that's in the family. So normally they, you have the chief and you have the queen mother who, who may be other sisters or cousins or aunties or something, but they are women. And in the North, you have corners. Corner, that's the same, it goes the same way, the sister or the auntie. And what I find interesting in my working with chiefs is that they play a very important role because they organize chiefs, the, the, the complaints of women go to these women who handle them. So that um, they, 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 they play a very important role and they have workshops, you know, and uh, of course, uh, if you look at democracy in the context of uh, uh, everybody becoming a chief, uh, that one, no, because uh, as I did mention, it's a belief system and it's something that we have inherited. And I'm, I was happy when my colleague mentioned that chieftaincy is a dynamic institution. So true. 
at the time when people were working on foot, chiefs were chiefs. When even the, 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 the colonialists came, chiefs were chiefs. During the colonial period, they were chiefs. There were problems, yes, but they were chiefs, and today they're chiefs. There is such a system. Uh, it needs to be understood. But I agree that uh, women, and I become happy when the, we have a very vibrant queer mother association in Ghana. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, Prof. Yamjo, there's a question here that do you see a future in African polit politics, uh, political system for chiefs, bearing in mind that the chiefs are just as victims to corruption as many other institutions. The corruption that is so endemic, the chief stancy institution is not spared. How do you see that uh, in terms of the future of the chiefs, the chiefs in politics in, in Africa? Yeah, I could say that uh, uh, corruption is like uh, the, the challenge of uh, 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 Christ with his uh, cross to Calvary. You fall three times, but each time you, take, you pick up and you carry your cross and you continue. If we were to be discouraged simply because we have uh, an instance of corruption here or there, we will soon run short out of any institution uh, uh, remotely connected to democracy. The importance is to develop systems for to ensure uh, uh, resilience, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, build firewalls, as it were, against uh, uh, those sort of drawbacks. Uh, and I would say that uh, chieftaincy remains very popular. Uh, you have today amongst your, uh, those contending to be chiefs, uh, very well educated, uh, 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 some of the best universities in the world with PhDs and uh, master's degrees all over. They come back and they don't, uh, they, they, they want to be chiefs. Uh, uh, you have, uh, uh, those who go uh, looking for uh, chief, chiefly titles, al almost like uh, uh, which, which may not uh, be recognized by the state to, to, to warrant them to have, uh, 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 allowances or, or like, but they, they want to be, uh, to be called honorary chiefs. So it, it's a very popular institution uh, uh, and uh, we need uh, to ensure that it it, it, it serves society uh, as best as it can. And we need to inspire the next generation to take it seriously and uh, to uh, it, it, it institutionalize uh, it in a way that uh, frees it of uh, the temptations of corruption and the weaknesses that are uh, uh, human. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dana. There, are, there is a question here which I think is suggesting that even though you have cited constitutional provisions that discourage or debar chiefs from engaging in partisan politics, in practice, it is happening. And there are chiefs who openly declare their support for one part, political party or the other. And there are some even oppose uh, become stumbling blocks in the way of development because they may not like the, the party in power, uh, in government. What do you have to say about that? And are there sanctions for chiefs who blatantly and openly do these things? Thank you very much. Um, there's a, a, something we call law and practice. I agree that uh, these things sometimes happen. In fact, the, it's a human institution. And what I know is that there, there, there is a code of ethics. The, the National House of Chiefs has its own code of ethics. And when these things happen, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they may not come out in public to you know, humiliate or uh, how do I put it? But there are ways that these things are handled because it's not good, it's not right. You see, and 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 I will say that if you had me writing my paper, it can be a double-edged sword 
today you may be happy if indeed you, you things are favor, only to find out that tomorrow that the tide is turned. And, and that's why I, I, I think personally, from the experience I've got of chieftaincy, I, I am not very sure whether uh, that, that course is good. For, for, I'm not talking for, for the politician, but for the chiefs. But I agree, those things happen. I mean, you, you sometimes hear these utterances and things time to time. But what I do know is that when they happen, if it is brought to the attention of, of the other chiefs, uh, behind the scenes, uh, people are cautioned or people are advised or whatever. But this is what happens. Thank you. Thank you. There's a, a related question, a related question posted uh, on the chat. And I'll come to the Abuaje uh, da Costa's races, and I'll come to you shortly. But there's a question here for both of you. A question here for both of both speakers. You talked so well, Dr. Dana, about the constitutional provisions of chiefs not getting involved in party politics. But the question is asking, what about parties political meddling in the installation of chiefs? Because you have political parties that favor an installed chiefs and de-installed and uninstalled chiefs that they don't like uh, and it's still happening. Are there constitutional provisions also stopping or barring politicians, political parties from also engaging in meddling into the chieftaincy affairs? Uh, Prof. Yamjo and then Dr. Dana. Um, Very quickly, I would, I would say that uh, for long, uh, politicians uh, have uh, uh, appreciated chiefs as vote banks. Uh, where you could go like a one-stop shop during elections and they guarantee that they're going to talk uh, to their people, their subjects, and they deliver votes to you. And you don't have to worry about campaigning anywhere. But I, I, I do think that uh, if we could take, take democracy seriously, not just by using the individual as a unit of analysis, but also by using groups, however you define groups, uh, whether free associations or uh, globe, groups by, by blood and by culture and, and, and communities that identify themselves through a common uh, 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 descent and so on. So you, you, you could take democracy both as a group right and an individual right at any given time and see how these two can complement each other. In that sense, you don't have to chase chiefs out of multi-party politics, but say that we are available as a, a given ethnic group uh, or given community to decide who is, which is the, the political party that would best serve us and our interests, collectively speaking, uh, as well as uh, over and above it, as individuals. If we need a new bridge or a new hospital, and a, a, a political party comes and speaks or convinces us and uh, commits to delivering that bridge to us, we can, uh, as a group, working through our chief, decide to harness our votes and uh, 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 support this political party with that understanding in mind. So I, I don't think chiefs should necessarily be chased out of uh, multi-party politics to make it easy for politicians uh, to, to, to love or uh, to benefit. It should be uh, interests and which, which collective interest uh, do we share as a community and how are we ready to, uh, to, to, to negotiate our way into the best deal in our national polit political life? Thank you. Dr. Dana, so the party political meddling into yes. installation of chiefs. Let me say that uh, it's wrong. The, the, I went like my paper, I did indicate that uh, wisdom dictated that the chiefs are kept from politics. And equally, the, the government not also to, to do what? Interfere. In fact, it's in the constitution. Recondition if you look at the present law, once you are just from the appropriate family and you're stood in red of Casper law, you are a chief. 
whether you 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 are able to work on the functions in the specification, but that does not affect your chieftaincy. So, if I've I've always said uh, the year, all the years I'm chieftaincy that it's as bad or problem where to interfere in instrument of chiefs, just as chiefs also doing what uh, meddling in politics. The two go together, and normally when one starts, the other one follows. They, 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 they are evil. There are two evils. So uh, meddling in the instrument, if you if a government should do that, surely sure as night follows day. One day, one day, it will come back because another government will come and do what the same. That's why I think that, uh, from my experience, I don't think it's good uh, that way to go. And who who suffers when the two elephants fight? Is the grass that suffer? So I think it's in the interest of the communities that there is no conflict between these two power, uh, the, the, the traditional power base and the political power base. That, Thank that's you. My, that, yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, Nana, uh, Abuajid Acosta, you have your hand up. Uh, the one with the device named Abuajid Acosta, please. If you can unmute and ask your question. Briefly and straight to the point. Well, I think my, my question is on the page, but um, let okay. me go ahead and. Uh, the, how can the chief be used as a resource rather than rather than constitute impaired impediment in our modern democracy? Thank you, thank you. And then, uh, how are they helping to change? Helping in changing to address the contemporary challenges in our society. And political environment. Thank you. So I think uh, um, I think any of the panels can help us briefly explain to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Yamjo. Do you want to say something about how chiefs can be their their, their influence and their 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 kind of role can be maximized uh, in, in 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 developing good governance in Africa. In a way, I think uh, they can play a major role in reminding the, the, the present dispensation that uh, there's a richness in the African histories and traditions on governance that one could draw on to enrich what we are doing now and not just uh, uh, tend to uh, treat them as relics of a past that nobody so you know, very few people desire, but just for symbolic purposes. So how do we uh, 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 harness all the work that has come through the institution uh, and, and uh, uh, to, to, to make our democracy much more complex and representative of the different traditions that have informed it? Uh, I think they can play that role very well uh, uh, by, by uh, bringing democracy as a group right to democracy as an individual right into greater conversation than is currently the case. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Elias Bongma, you have your hand up. Do you have a question that you want to raise? Just a second. <laughs> No, I just wanted to uh, point out uh, uh, something that uh, Professor Yamjo, uh, both Professor Yamjo and uh, uh, Professor Dana said that is very important, the democratic aspect uh, of that. Uh, very often, I think in my part of Cameroon, we have found out that uh, usually it is, it is not that the local leaders are not democratic, it is actually actors in the state that uh, prevent the chief from acting in a very democratic way. A very quick example, at some point in my village, uh, because the chief was not fulfilling his role well, uh, the council and all of the sub chiefs decided to depose him. But rather than working with the locals, the local administrator, government administrator, arrested all of the sub chief and put them under detention for more than two and a half years, uh, trying to force them to accept a chief that had been deposed because he was not following uh, the rules of the village. So sometimes it's modern state itself that is actually a hindrance to uh, this kind of local leadership. 
And very quickly to Nicole's question, in my area, uh, when a chief dies, they cannot install a new chief when they have not installed a queen mother. So the queen mother who sits by the chief, who has authority, uh, it's installed in the same traditional fashion like the chief is installed first. Now that does not really mean that uh, it is all a democratic institution and women have equal rights. I think we still need to get to a point where that power is balanced, but the institutions allow for queen mothers to be installed then they support the village in presiding over the installation of the new chief. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Mongma. Thank you. Good to have you all the way from, uh, is it uh, California or wherever you are in the States? Thank you. Uh, there's a question here asking, does the role of the chief in politics or party politics, if you like, have something to do with the nature of the state, whether the state is a monarchy or a republic. Because in Southern Africa, there's a mention of this uh, chief King Nswati, who is fully fledged politician uh, and his powers are, guarant are enshrined in the constitution and he can appoint parliamentarians. Uh, and uh, in fact, appoint 20 members of the House of Senate, of the Senate. So does the role of the chief in pot politics or party politics have something to do with the nature of the state, uh, monarchy versus a republic? Uh, if both of you can briefly comment on those, please. Start with Prof. Yamjo. Yes, I, I, I think, again, we, 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 we mentioned them in very generic terms, uh, chiefs. And uh, you would realize that uh, 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 some of them are kingdoms that uh, would uh, compete favorably uh, with uh, uh, the, the current, uh, uh, the, the UK, and uh, uh, it's modeled in, in a similar fashion. So, so the, 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 the king, uh, 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 in question here is a king who presides over a kingdom, uh, 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 and 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 uh, because uh, he is above partisan politics, uh, he has a prime minister who uh, runs government, but he gives a, uh, uh, does a ceremonial role, but he, uh, with, with with formidable powers, uh, just as uh, similar to if you wanted something to compare to uh, the, the queen. Of, 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 of Britain, uh, uh, but it's true that when when you then have a republic, you want to strip everybody, even those who uh, uh, preside over kingdoms of of of, of, of such magnitude. Uh, uh, you you purge them of direct uh, political action uh, in order to make it possible for. Uh, 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 to be able to speak the language of a republic. So it, it depends which option a, 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 a country chooses, uh, but uh, uh, the, the role would then shift. But basically, if you, you wanted to make a radical argument, you could also claim that most of these, even the small chiefdoms, in historical perspective, would, without the colonial experience of collapsing and uh, uh, cutting across, uh, you would have found uh, 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 them to lay claim to the fact that I am the head of this country, of this uh, group, uh, this uh, uh, group of people that passed for its own country, as you would you, you would compare uh, with others today. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dana. Do you want to say something about that? There's well, a specific question for you that I. Want to well, the, the, let, me, let, me, let me take that one. Yeah. The question is the role of queen mothers. What is the role of queen mothers? Le related to the question that Nicole was asking about women, gender issues. What is the role of queen mothers in the selection of chiefs and even local, political, local politicians, local political leaders? Queen mothers play a very important role. Uh, 
as said before, in the, when it comes to nomination and election of chiefs, they play a very, a very, very vital role. And this, uh, vice versa, the student and all that. Um, but taking the other angle of it, uh, the, uh, and I would like to mention some, some somebody said earlier, uh, there is a the feeling that probably more, more can, can still be done uh, by way of key mothers participating or, and I think this thing is a process. And uh, before 2008, it was only chiefs, paramount chiefs, who were paid allowances in, in, in Ghana. Then uh, gradually, it changed. Today, paramount queen mothers are paid allowances. So it, it's, it's um, one thing about uh, traditional uh, in my studies is that uh, a tradition is not the same as a custom. A custom, uh, when we talk about tradition, we talk about a custom that has gone on for very long time, being passed from generation to generation. And when, you, when we want to make changes to these things, uh, of course they change, but they, they sometimes it's, it's gradual. If you, if you don't do it well, then you may end up with a different thing altogether, which may not help. I think that give the next 20, 30 years, I think that uh, uh, the Queen Mother Association will be more, more vit vit vitalized, you know, and uh, the, nowadays too, we are getting a lot of educated people, like was said before, who are coming to chieftaincy, both the, the chiefs and then the Queen Mothers. And that's good because and then they are able to, you know, appear in fora and then deliver. Uh, and so that quite apart from whatever installation functions they play, they can also have a role to play, you know, nationally um, in seminars and things. So I think, I think the, 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 what we have seen in Ghana gradu gradually, Queen Mother's, uh, what it, they are today, I don't think it was like that some, uh, 2000, I mean, this is gradually, we are seeing a change. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a question here. I want us to wrap up in the next uh, two, three minutes. But there's a question here on uh, when there's a conflict between chiefs and uh, for the, the, the state, the chief, especially over land. And I think, uh, Dr. Dana, if I understood you properly, uh, in earlier conversations, it depends on where the land, who the land is invested in. in. If the land is invested in the, the state, then the state has the upper hand. Where the land is, is invested in stools and skins, the, the, the chiefs have an upper hand. Am I, am I correct in assuming that, Dr. Dana? Yes, you are correct. In fact, Ghana, we, we, one of the, we, if we look at our, our constitution, um, it says all stool, the, the stool lands, you know, they are vested in stool, the land is vested in stool, about 80%. So when government needs land and the land is stool land, government has to get in touch with the stool for to release that land. I mean, to talk about it. If it's development, normally they release land, you know. But if, it's, uh, if it's, in some areas, the land belongs to clans, clans or families. but. Stools and skins, they have the largest land in Ghana, about 80%. You know, their lands commission uh, administrators, but it's vested in the stools. And so um, if there's a quarrel be between the state and the, the chiefs, first question you would like to find out is where, where, where is it, where is this happening? Is it the area where there is this stool land? Is it clan land? Is it land already vested in the state? This is the, these are the issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof. Yamjo, you, you raised in your paper, you talked about how democracy may not, liberal democracy may not necessarily suit the African system. What exactly did you mean? That sometimes we want to force to stream the corpse to fit the, 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 the casket. What exactly did you mean that uh, there are challenges that have to do with liberal democracy working in African societies? 
Yeah, I, I think, John, I've already given examples of exactly what I meant by saying we should not uh, uh, dismiss democracy as a group right too, too quickly. We shouldn't overly uh, 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 invest in the individual as the only unit of analysis and uh, by so, so doing claimed a certain degree of autonomy for individuals that, that does not <laughs> That, that does not reflect the, the, the lived circumstance. Individuals often are composites of uh, the, 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 the long tradition, uh, rich traditions that uh, uh, Dana referred to, as well as uh, 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 the, 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 the crystallizations of freedoms, uh, human freedoms that we have all embraced. And often democracy, if caricatured, would require you to choose between these two instead of challenging you to blend them for good effect. I just wanted to say that we shouldn't rush to easy solutions uh, for to complex issues. Thank you. Dr. Dana, there's a, there's a very important question for you. Do, in your experience, do you know of situations where people with disabilities have been made royals have been chosen as chiefs or queen mothers. Do you know of that? If yes, where? If no, why not? Thank you. Um, I have come across some, but I think they were installed or they were skinned before they had the sicknesses. And normally they will not install them for that reason. And particularly if they are, if, I mean, normally, even when the chief is not well, there, there's a provision that the chief next in seniority. So there's always somebody to assist. But let me say something. I think the reason why probably uh, persons with disability have been seen in the royal descent is that uh, our previous experience to have shown that pe 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 people with disability have never been seen to be worth, uh, worth anything anyway. And so uh, uh, that probably explains it. And I think when the Disability Act was being prepared in Ghana, um, I was then I just, I, was, I had been called to bar. Uh, and because I was the first in the history to do, do this kind of thing, most uh, disabled people who had problems came to me for my assistance. And one of the things that came to my attention was that there was the, the, the chieftaincy, the, the, sorry, the disability law the, in the preparation. Uh, there was something like uh, people should not discriminate against uh, people based on crim uh, cultural practices or and blah blah blah. But and they say except that this shall not apply to chieftaincy. So therefore, what it means is that yes, you shouldn't discriminate. But in the case of chieftains, you can discriminate. I quickly got in touch with the attorney general, and it turned out that the the the, 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 the nobody even knew who did that. So it was removed. So if a, a person with disability cannot sit on the stool, that should depend on that traditional area. It should not be anything, I don't think, because legally it's wrong. Like my, we all know it. If they, they leave the constitution, the supreme law of the land, and the supreme, supreme law have said something, how then do you undermine the supreme law? But traditionally, if it is the case that that is the tradition of the area, Probably my only this thing would be that uh, as I, I believe that things change, but they change slowly because these are not parliamentary laws, but these are things that have been generations. And so with time, probably they can change. But for now, I've not yet come across, uh, you know, uh, somebody who is, uh, uh, you know, disabled and then they are doing it too. But I, I think that, uh, as I've said, this, I, this is what I think. The, 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 maybe it's a matter for the tradition area. Thank you so much, Dr. Dana. Well, friends, our time is really well spent. And uh, I want to register a profound gratitude to our two speakers for handling this very interesting topic and the participation and the uh, engagement all 
testifies to that fact. I want to also take this opportunity to thank our partners, uh, the Project uh, for Religious Freedom and Society in Africa at Yale Macmillan Center for their partnership, uh, and to thank our, 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 our colleagues who have joined us from Yale, uh, and to thank Dr. Bongma, Professor Bongma, especially also for pointing me to uh, Prof. Nyamjo uh, for this presentation. Thank you all. We will upload the. Some of you are asking about the video. We, we normally upload it onto our website. So please uh, be on the look. We'll, we'll clean it up and upload it on the website uh, by next week, latest. So you should have it on the Sunny Institute website. Thank you all very much and have wonderful evenings and days wherever you may be. God bless you all. Bye bye.